Okay, I'm David. Um, welcome to this session. It's about uh, standing for something. I'm not going to sing, um, but Bob Dylan famously did in the 1970s that <coughs> if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Um, and that's, that's a message that brands seem to have recently taken to heart. Uh, we've seen, I mean, interesting to see Adam uh, and his latest campaign, standing, Coke standing for inclusivity. Uh, we've seen Nike famously trying to, to stand for the, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement with the controversial Colin Kaepernick execution. Uh, Gillette, again, did they get it right in terms of their backing of the Me Too movement? And possibly most extreme of all, Patagonia suing uh, the United States government for uh, misappropriation of Native American land uh, and issuing lawsuits uh, to that effect. So brands are certainly trying to stand for something. Purpose seems to be uh, what they're, they're all striving for. And yet it comes in the context of record lows of brand trust and trust in institutions in general. Uh, 2018 saw the lowest ever scores for um, business, government, media and NGOs uh, in Australia. The first time that all four had got negative trust, net trust index scores in the Edelman survey. Um, and we saw advertisers getting a lower public opinion than bankers in 2018. Uh, so on the one hand, huge erosion of, brand tr of, of trust in institutions, and yet um, in, uh, brands moving towards purpose uh, to try and establish trust. So is, is purpose the way to do that? Is that what's going to be the, uh, the solution to this? And in, in fact, is trust um, a, a vital ingredient in brand success? Uh, so here to talk about that with me, I'll go from, uh, from left to right. We've got Nigel Sito, he's the country manager for Ancestry.com. Uh, Caitlin Lloyd is Group Strategy Director for Mindshare. Nicole McInnes is CMO of uh, Media and Telecom's uh, uh, startup OVO. Uh, Justin Graham is the Chief Strategy Officer for MNC Saatchi and Peter Miller at the end there, CEO of News Media Works. Uh, Caitlin, I might start with you, if I may. Yeah. Um, about this question of whether trust is actually important. Uh, Facebook is across the world the least trusted brand. It gets lowest scores of trust in Australia and yet last year they registered 50% increase in revenue. Their users were stable. They spent longer on the platform and we now have a third of all millennials saying Facebook is my primary news source. So does it matter? Who cares? Yeah, I mean, the things you've talked about right at the beginning are pretty depressing in terms of lowering trust in almost every institution, um, not least advertising. So I'll talk to that first before coming back maybe to social because Facebook are actually a client of Mindshare, so I'll be careful there. Um, but I also think it's one of those things where we're in a bubble in marketing and we read lots of things about privacy and data and lack of trust from consumers. And like you've just said, Facebook is not losing a lot of customers. I'm sure there's many people in this room that are still posting Instagram stories most days. So I think it's a bit of a case of what are we saying and what are people actually doing and where's the balance. But um, yeah, to go back to trust, I think I'm an unapologetic optimist about marketing and, and brands in general. And I think it's a good thing that traditional institutions and trust in things like government and education and the church are declining because that opens up a really nice opportunity for brands um, to have a real purpose in people's lives. And I think that can only be a good thing for people who work in this industry, so everyone in the room. Um, and the way I kind of look at it is, internet's given us geographic access to information. So we've gone from looking to those institutions of circumstance to institutions of choice. And we can now find our own way of you know, governing our lives and, and brands you know, add value to that. And watching that reel at the beginning, it just reminded me, you know, I, I live with an Australian and he showed me that Vegemite ad and the aeroplane jelly ad literally this weekend, much like Adam. I get a lot of trouble for talking about work at home. And he loves those brands. He genuinely you know, cares about them. And yes, it may sound silly that what spread we put on the toast in the morning matters, but it does matter. And anyone that's had a conversation about Vegemite or Marmite will know that. You know, if you've had a, a crappy day and you come home and you want something comforting on toast and you have had that ad drilled into you for 
however many years, it's going to have a purpose in your life. It may not make you go out like a Patagonia and, you know, protest against climate change, but it's going to make you feel comforted and you're always going to choose it. Okay, so, so those, are, those are strong brands in, in, uh, uh, in people's lives. Mm. I, I'm interested in the role of, of purpose and, and the sort of ethical purpose behind that, standing for something. Mm. Uh, uh, Justin, you, you've done a, a bit of work a, around this. Is, is purpose, is it, is it necessary? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I think this has got to be the scariest um, panel title I've ever seen. Does your brand stand for something in the eyes of consumers? If you walk into that and you don't think the brand stands for something, then we've got a, a serious problem and the brands we work on have serious problems. Um, I, I think, yeah, coming back to purpose, I think um, purpose is been washed across our industry over the last few years. Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting piece because I think it's, this isn't a beat up on Facebook and I, I know you're <laughs> going to uh, defend them as a client as well. But it's interesting, you know, I think the Ipsos report from last year talked about uh, Facebook being one of the most influential brands still in Australia. I think top five, as well as the banks, as well as Google as well. Um, and so there's this sort of two speed thing going on where the utility is brilliant, but the trust is at an all time low. And I don't know whether that's an age demographic. I haven't looked into that enough, but I think there is something going on there. Um, and I think per back, coming back to your question around purpose, I think absolutely. I think that uh, those words are, um, around Coke are a great example of that. It's not so much that purpose needs to be, I guess, the guiding light, but it should be embraced from the top of an organisation down. I think we've all been in organisations or done purpose work where uh, it's come in uh, halfway through and uh, and it's some great words on a page but it doesn't really mean anything overall uh, and I think if purpose can absolutely guide you forward um, then absolutely that's going to take you back to a place where I think a lot of the Australian organisations are facing at the moment is just because we can should we and I think that was the big thing that came through with the Royal Commission overall I think it was the thing that's come through with some of our sporting bodies recently that's been mentioned already today I think purpose um, gives you that um, ethical uh, framework to start making decisions uh, and it may, means you can mean something beyond just um, price and product and all the things that we've talked about there. And is it critical in, in establishing trust? Do you have to have a purpose, an overt purpose? Because we are talking about you know, brands that, that are actively getting behind causes. Do, do, do they, is, that, is that critical in establishing trust? I don't think so. I don't think you absolutely have to have an overt purpose. I think it's, it would be nice. I think it's brands that have evolved, I guess, in a new, new companies, so the last 20 years, are often entrepreneurs that come through and they build these organisations purpose out. I think there's brands that have existed for a very long time that have said, we need a purpose, uh, and they often don't stick in an organisation as well. That doesn't mean that those older style brands um, are any, should be any less trustworthy or being able to drive trust overall. I think you, know, you mentioned a couple of those brands up front 10 years ago, I was in the US and I was on a very interesting call where um, the CMO from Procter & Gamble at the time was debating whether they were going to dump Tiger Woods after his indiscretions. Now he was their highest profile athlete at a time where Nike were also, he was also their highest profile athlete and Nike took the decision to stick with him based on what that organisation was about, and P&G, which owned Gillette, uh, which was the brand I was working on, decided to dump him based on where they went. And I think it's quite interesting. It's not a right or a wrong, it's just an organisation going with conviction in a different way. And I, and I trust both those organisations and buy into them in very different ways. So I think it's just, it's the conviction around where a brand's going and it comes back to standing for something being differentiated. Okay. I, I want to bring in Nicole at this point because um, you, you've got a relatively new brand yeah. in market. Um, how do you, do you kind of consciously go about establishing trust or, or defining a purpose or, or how does it work? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you definitely need trust, especially when you're a new brand, like you say, because um, even if it's a simple utility like your phone, it's actually necessary to your life. So if it, if it doesn't work, it's going to cause real problems. So you need to establish some level of trust, but I don't think purpose um, is necessarily the best way to do it. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like people went, oh, we need trust, so let's link that, that to the most logical next step, which is purpose, which is sort of emotional as well. They're both emotional, so let's go there. But I think what we've done with purpose is we've completely overestimated the, the state of brands in people's minds 
first of all. Most of the time, brands pop in and out of people's minds for split seconds. And it's in those moments that you create utility and make their life better, which is much more important to them than if you believe in something over here. Because they're not actually thinking about you in the context of their lives on a daily basis. Um, it, it may, in a highly competitive situation, make you be a choice over another commoditized brand that's exactly the same. But I think we um, also underestimate the cynicism that people have. So if you do you know, latch onto a purpose with your brand and it doesn't actually, it's not purpose built from the start, like that's why your brand exists, people will see through it straight away and just go, oh, they're on the bandwagon and, they were, and they'll actually erode trust. So it's a really, it's a fine line with purpose. And I think it's better if you start, unless you, unless you have a purpose built company, um, and the whole startup is based on that. I think you, you're better to watch those moments that you're in people's lives and make those, those people's lives better and make sure that's right and focus on that more so than running off and doing something the media will latch onto and, and it look not genuine. Okay. Um, <laughs> authenticity, I think, is, is going to be a, is a key part yeah. of this. And, and that people talk, it's one of those buzzwords, right? I don't know if it was mentioned in that list of, of uh, bullshit bingo, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's probably could have been. Um, and, and so many brands these days are, are, are global, and yet uh, to be authentic, they've got to act local. So uh, and how much can you, how do you do that effectively? Nigel, you, you're obviously running a, a brand which is international, but you're trying to define it here in, in Australia. Uh, so how do you do how do you do that with a, uh, a jug, make that juggling act work? Yeah, well, I think like it comes down to if there is uh, you know we've talked about lofty purposes. I think we're very fortunate at Ancestry that we are a company that has a real impact on people's lives. Uh, so we do have a mission about uh, we empower journeys of personal discovery to enrich lives, and that sounds kind of lofty. And Caitlin, don't hit me, but. Um, <laughs> but you know, when you see the effect that our brand does have on people, it really empowers like everyone from the CEO down to really live that purpose. So I think the beauty of that from a global level, like we can add local nuance and insight to that in Australia. So I think one of the key um, levers you have when you're working for a local part of a global company is making sure you're really tapping into local nuance and insight because there's nothing worse than trying to transplant an American tone of voice or an English tone of voice and just plopping it in Australia because people can see through that. I think customers and consumers are much more savvy now about you know brands that are talking to them and if you're trying to uh, talk about something that's not relevant or talk in a way that just doesn't have any impact on the people like people can see right through that so I think the local nuance and insight is the really key part about making sure that it's relevant. It's an interesting point you make about the internal stakeholders. Because there's an element of this, isn't there? And let's, let's be honest, there's an element of this, which is, which is internal marketing. You're just trying to make, A, you're trying to make ourselves feel better as marketers, that we're doing something important. And it's, you know, I can go home and tell my mum I'm doing a real job. And, and there's an element of trying to get, you know, boost uh, internal employee engagement, make everyone feel like they're on a, you know, they're, they're, they're curing cancer and saving the world. <laughs> when actually they're just manufacturing toilet paper. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it can, it, it, how much, w what point do you cross the line towards this, this is bullshit uh, and is going to be called out as such? <laughs> Well, I think at the end of the day, you have to look like, why does your brand or company exist? Like if you are like a mayonnaise manufacturer, like great, like make the best mayonnaise ever. If you're a fly spray, fantastic. But I don't think you need to ladder up every brand. I think to Justin's point, it's great if you have a unifying purpose that the company can get behind, but that doesn't need to be global peace. Like if you're you know, a sock company or something like that, it can just be like making the most comfortable socks ever or making more tea that works. Like that's great. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's just about, it has to be true and it has to come from the top of the organization down. Uh, if you bring it in midway through the organization and it's just a brief that goes to your creative agency or it's a PR release you put out to media and you start you know talking about it but you're not actually living that in your supply chain or your organizational culture that's where it starts to fall apart because if you're not living and breathing it you can't actually talk about it yeah and how much of this is it Peter I want to bring in you at this point you, you represent a lot of brands that have been around a long time uh, and uh, and have a, a heritage of of, um, of being trusted so how much is this sort of purpose thing and this, the, the, uh, the latching on to standing for something and causes, how much is that a trend and a fad? And how do you think, how much do you think that's just going to, that, uh, that's just going to, as we look to the future, that's going to be sustainable or it's actually just going to be surpassed by the next trend in marketing? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, the, the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, it, you know, it feels like fad to me. 
but um, but it, it may it may become more important. I mean, it's a great differentiator. Sam Moyson, who's a AFL commissioner, um, said to me that the the, AFL, the footy clubs in the AFL that, that are really successful have got something in common, and that is total alignment between the chair, the board, the co the coach, or the chief executive, the coach, and the players. When they and and so, I think I in violent agreement with my friends up here that it's very it's fantastic. Uh, a fantastic driver for behaviours in an organisation and for commitment and, and um, buying in. Uh, to me, it's an organisational change thing. Um, in branding, though, in, in marketing to consumers, um, gee whiz, they, 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 can, they can sniff something that stinks from a long way off. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, they support a footy team because they believe in it and through thick and thin if it's behaving, performing badly or performing well. But when it comes to marketing products and services and, and, and brands, um, you know, the, the, the purpose thing can be a weapon. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen some recent exa examples of it with Nike. So they made a weapon of a, of a virtue. They did believe in something and they've used it in their marketing because, you know, there's no prizes for keeping something good a secret. So, you know, I don't think any brand marketer should apologise for marketing to a, a lofty, higher order purpose whatsoever. They should do it. But they've got to be on the, you know, they've got to be on the juice. They've got to know that the consumers in their target market are going to buy it. I'm just concerned that it's slightly cynical. That although these are worthy causes, there's nothing wrong with again. With, this is somehow a populist sort of. Oh, this is the sort of stuff that we've we've done our focus groups. We've understood this is important to people, so we're going to jump on that. And that's all. And it's a quite slightly cynical approach to marketing, rather than something that the. That I don't think that works that well at all. I'd agree with these guys. Uh, that that uh, that gets spotted. Mm. What role does the media, as a, as a representative of the media industry, yeah. what, what role does the medium play in terms of uh, the context in which that communication takes place? Well, I reckon a great creative campaign, the best creative campaign in a dud media, you're just washing off opportunities. I think um, you know, consumers, uh, in spite of what we've heard earlier around trust and, and what have you, the traditional media have been ra ranked in several studies internationally and locally. Um, we've, we've done 7,500 interviews. And people are returning to things that they do, they can grip onto that media owners that haven't addressed down the road. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the high street in small towns in the country, but in the big cities as well. Um, I think trust is a big driver. We've got evidence to say that it's an inv it inv it, it, trust in brands and trust in content drives purchase intent. Well, I think it's an, it's an important agreement. It's an important lever. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's a competitive proposition that, that you know, I, I would put on behalf of, you know, our news media owners, but also to, you know, television and radio and outdoor. Um, these are, these, you can, you can always find someone to complain to there and they'll listen. Justin, would you, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think I was actually thinking more around um, something you mentioned up front, Caitlin, as well. Just to, something to, I guess, disagree. I understand where you're coming from around mm. the... Um, the fact that there's a huge opportunity for us in the room here to be looking at um, uh, the downfall of trust around our institutions provides an opportunity for us as brands. I think that's absolutely right. And maybe it's too ideological, but actually I think we want all boats to rise again. We want better leaders across all institutions to be driving that and we want to be a part of that as well. I, th I do think it's interesting though around the opportunity that's happened because when the shit does hit the fan, um, it seems that um, people that understand people and I think there was some conversation from um, Coke around the customer um, is a truthful source in the end. People that understand people should be the people in this room are the ones that are called on to understand how we get ourselves out of it. How do we start taking a purpose or a thought through the whole organisation? I think, Nigel, you talked about purpose only purpose if it goes into supply chain and all the elements of a business as well. And I think for many years, um, what we've done, media and advertising, has been distant to the actual commercial um, driving opportunities of an organisation as well. And what has happened over the last few years is that as we've started to look at trust as a major issue and how purpose could potentially solve that, it's called on people in this room, hopefully, to start bringing that through. And I think that is a huge opportunity for us. Do you mind if I respond to that? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I guess the thing for me is that distance between media, right? So I have a lot of banking clients. I also have a lot of insurance clients. So the Royal Commission is always a really fun time where they come to us and say, 
what do I do? Do I pull all of my advertising or do I stay out there and mm. just try and push it through? Um, and it's different for every brand, obviously. But I think for me, coming back to that purpose and whether it's built in or whether it's a bolt on, that's the difference. So as an example, because I always find it easier when people give examples for IAG, they have had a partnership with the SES for however long. So again, my partner likes to be with NRMA because he's from New South Wales and he knows the SES if a you know, tree falls down like it did last week our mate and her husband who volunteers are going to be around to fix it. So that gives a bit of credence to them going out and saying, help us who we are. Whereas, and I'm slightly worried Toyota is a client of yours, but they've done some great advertising and I think they've done some great purpose as well. So for anyone that didn't see it, they did a Land Cruiser, um, huge piece of innovation where they found a really great human insight, which was that in the outback, people are actually closer to a Land Cruiser sometimes than they are to a mobile signal. So what can we do if we turn Land Cruisers into mobile signals so that people can then, if they're in an emergency, much like the SES, they can get help. That was a beautiful idea. And I think the research that went into it was great, but nothing happened after that. And that's where that cynicism, I think, from people comes in, where it's like, well, was that just to make ourselves feel better and show our mom that we won an award, or was it to help people? And again, I don't know that campaign behind the scenes, but those are the things where I think purpose has to follow through. And the Gillette ad is a great example of that, where lots of people in Australia and the UK who have a very high bullshit detector were like, this seems really cringe and I don't want to associate it, whereas it might have gone down better in the States, were quite surprised when they realized, well, Gillette's actually putting the money where the mouth is and they are investing in the causes that they care about, but you might not necessarily get it from watching that mm. ad. Mm. And you've got to expect that people are willing to research, which to your point earlier, most people don't care about brands at all unless it's in the next second where they're going to use it. Mm. Okay, I'm, I want to go on to, uh, to talk about uh, data in a, in a moment. But before we do that, could, is, has anybody got any questions for the panel on, on this area around trust and purpose? Got any, any questions from the floor? So I'll try and uh, summarise that question uh, for, <laughs> no, no, just, for, just to make sure everyone can hear it. But uh, I think the question was, why have we got to this point? Why, why have, uh, has brand uh, trust been eroded and why do brands feel they need to have now a purpose or jump onto a, a, a cause to stand for something? Uh, uh, is that more or less the, the gist of your question? Who wants to take that? Uh, <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> oh, look, I, you know, I just think it's a mad rush for a competitive edge and you grab, you grab one whenever you can. And that's not cynical as long as you're not false and, and uh, you're not pretending. You know, if you've got a great story to tell, you've got to find a story which differentiates you in some way, people will do it. And I think, you know, um, the higher order issues and purpose has been a new a newfound way in the last couple of years to, to, to be doing that, to be telling stories about uh, companies and people behind brands. Add some passion. I don't think it's just um, bad behaviour from brands, although that definitely contributes. I think it's the democratisation of information through social media, but also the sort of the thought or the insight amongst marketers that millennials really love this. They think it's the best thing and they need it to choose a brand. So I think it's it's sort of a vortex of all three rather than just the fact that brands have behaved badly because companies haven't changed. Companies have been bad for, for decades and decades and decades. So the, I think there's, there's these other factors that have come in that, that have created this fad. Isn't there also an element of democratisation here that, that you've got big corporations and 
big brands are associated with those noble. corporations are lumped in with with government and other establishment organizations institutions mm. then there is now a movement to say we can do something about that you know we're, we're seeing the rise of, of anti-establishment populism in in politics especially mm. um and is it, is it a is it a move is it a move by brands away from that to say well we're not actually establishment because we back these causes <laughs> is that a bit cynical i i'm i'm a bit with peter they're just looking for whatever will make them whatever's popular at the time and trying to jump on that. And I think the, the sniff test is if, if a brand jumps on the latest thing the media is talking about, then it's going to be less authentic <laughs> and, and at the root cause of... Um, so a lot of brands jumped on um, marriage equality, Gillette jumped on mm. Me Too movement. They're not going to land as well because people are seeing that the media is driving this and the brand is piggybacking on rather than it being starting with the brand and what the brand means. So I think that's the first place. And, and um, Peter put on an event um, last year where the news, I, I didn't understand sort of how, you know, the podcast teacher's pet came about, but the editor of the newspaper talked about one of his journalists wanting to, to chase this story down. He had to let him off the payroll for six months and, and find you know, a replacement for him as a reporter at the newspaper so that he could do this podcast. Now that's real purpose. Like that changed um, people's lives. It changed, it, it brought justice. And I think when you see purpose like that and then you see a Gillette ad or a Pepsi ad, you kind of just go, you know, <laughs> there's a bit of a difference. Nigel. Yeah, I think, I think there has been a cultural shift though as well that's helping drive and I kind of touched on it before, but I think, you know, going back 50 years, like the church, government, there was these big institutions that helped give people their identity and they felt they belonged to. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly over the last 20 years, like brands are starting to take a mantle a little bit more. And I think the big difference there is the brands that are doing it because it's authentically who they are and the brands that are just doing it to jump on the bandwagon. And I think for us, one of the big ways of seeing that is like, are the are the company's business KPIs aligned with the customer KPIs? And I think that's where some of the misalignment and the issues happen because at the end of the day, everyone has profit targets to hit or uh, acquisition targets, but that's not mutually exclusive with doing the right thing by your customers. So I think when you start to focus on one, but not putting your customers at the center of that, that's when you start to move away from there. Mm. Mm. I think it's a simple thing as well that you just hear about dissatisfaction more. You don't have to write a letter to your bank to tell them you're unhappy with the way they're managing your super anymore. You can just post it and therefore you're going to hear more people be annoyed than ever before. So you've got to have a thicker skin to be in marketing these days, I think. I think and you I, can't get too upset yeah. when people, you know, you're not going to please everyone. To Adam's point earlier, that Coke ad is not going to please a lot of people, but you've got to be all right with that. They're not the customers maybe that you want. Yeah, I think, um, I feel like Back to the Gillette piece, it was um, it, it was probably poorly done, but it was in the right space. I think there's an executional element and there's a the purpose element behind it. And I think that the, their global CMO, Mark Pritchard, who's very similar to Keith Weed at Unilever, is absolutely driving his brands to a better place from what I can see and what he's saying. And actually the industry to a better place around all the work that he's doing around media transparency in the US. Um, and I think it comes back to that point around, um, you know, time will tell, history will tell whether these are the right decisions because they are the right decisions to be made now. Gillette is a, Gillette's a brand which is far and away the biggest male brand in the world. You know, I saw a sort of stat that 850 million men use Gillette every day around the world. There's only three and a half billion men in the world. So, I mean, this, this, is, this is a brand that has enormous impact on our world. And, you know, the, the thinking behind that was actually breakdown of the traditional family unit, father-son relationships, um, the positive role models of parents on young boys. Actually, there, there is an opportunity for a brand that sits there in a bathroom or wherever it might be with uh, young boys that can have a positive message around what the male image can look like moving forward is actually a really positive thing. Mm. I, I didn't realise they were doing all the work in the background around supporting um, charities, etc. And I think that's that's even better. So I don't think, I think it's, um, I think if you're coming from the right place and you stick to it, these brands don't always get it right. Nike doesn't always get it right. But actually, if you stick to it with conviction, like Coke has, um, I, think, I think that's how you start bringing trust back to it, because at least you stand for something back to the point around in, in a consumer's mind. I will but, shut up about this as well, but just that point on the brand and the consumer values being the same. Gillette is a masterclass in that, because although a lot of men don't like that ad, women buy the majority of razors and most women do like that ad so for me that's a real mm. 
example of a company understanding who actually buys the product and who they want to influence. Because, you know, Mark Ritson, as wonderful as he is, made a huge point about Gillette's, you know, the market leader, they stand for more to lose than Nike would with the, the Colin Kaepernick he had. But they're not losing much because they're focusing on the person who's buying the razor. And it's a perfect example of the old Old Spice ad. Who's your actual target audience? It's not necessarily the person that's using it. It's the person that's buying it. That's a good segue into data. Mm. Um, <laughs> I <work out> now. <laughs> because there's a, there's, a, there's a paradox here, isn't there? The, 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 there's an expectation, we've, I think we all as marketers realize that, that, that there's an expectation from the consumer that they are getting a more personalized experience these days, more of their personal information is available, therefore I expect you to use that to, to customize my experience with you. And yet, the use of that data is often what erodes trust. So uh, Deloitte survey suggests that 85% of consumers do not believe that brands handle their data with any integrity. Um, so how do you handle that? Now there's a couple of data-driven businesses on the, on, on the panel here. Um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to Nicole first for this one. Uh, you describe yourself as a data geek, but with creative heart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've been in, um, I probably, uh, before OVO, I was um, MD of eHarmony, and so we had a depth of data about people that um, most companies dream about. Um, and that, actually, you probably don't want to know some of the things we knew about our customers. So, because um, they'd answer 150 questions to join eHarmony, um, so we'd know the depths of their soul, basically. <laughs> but we, I mean, we didn't do anything um, evil with that it was actually all shut down and and the algorithm used it only for what it was designed for which was compatibility but i think that the thing that's interesting that i see happening now um and look we are using a lot of data you'll hear about that later today at ovo as well but what's happening now since um the scandal with facebook is that a lot of people are calling for uh, marketers and companies to ask consumers um, to give them permission to use their data in certain ways. And I'm really concerned about this because innovation will stall dramatically if you go to consumers and say, I'm going to use your data in this way, is that okay with you? They will definitely say no initially, um, but therefore ne never get to experience what you're going to do with the data. And look, I think there is, there is ways this can all go wrong, but the, I suppose my, my inner geek says most companies are trying to make the consumer's life better with this data use. And it's, they're just shooting themselves in the foot if they don't. So it's kind of, um, it's only sort of the Googles and the Facebooks that are, I, I think, really dangerous or could turn bad. And then we're all in the shit. But other <coughs> companies are just trying to, to get the consumer's life better, be relevant in their lives. And that's all they're doing with the data. So I think it's, I think it's a bit of a beat up and we shouldn't be as afraid as we are. Justin, is that the answer? Not to tell them what they're doing, you're doing with the data and just use it anyway and don't, <laughs> yeah. don't be transparent? No, ask, that, that. Them, ask them after the experience, after they've experienced <laughs> what you've given them with the personalization. Then say, is the experience good enough? And if not, then you can stop using it. <laughs> but don't do it before the experience. <laughs> Oh, look, I think there's an element of truth in that, actually. I think there's, I think, um, you know, brands coming from the right place need to be driving innovation and, um, and need to take consumers on a journey around that. Um, I think there's, look, I think we're in a really fascinating time, clearly. You know, we've just gone through the sort of my health records mm. from a community point of view, and there's been all sorts of backlash against that. There's open banking's going to be, you know, the next piece on the horizon for us. Um, and that, that just puts, I guess, the onus for people to start owning their own data again. And people, some people want it, some people don't want it. And there's just skepticism around that. There's just confusion around that. People love the extra services, you're absolutely right, and the innovation that's coming that way. Um, but I think overall, people are sitting there in fear around, around what's going on. And I think this is before we move to a world where voice will be the primary form of communication where we'll be sitting there and everyone will be listening all the time and we'll have to try and reconcile how brands work in a world where all I do is I don't type, I don't 
search things, I just say things. And I think in that world, actually, that's truly when everyone will be listening and then truly in a less private world, what data will start to really challenge how we feel about mm. how brands engage with us. Nigel, how, do you, how does Ancestry handle the very sensitive data that you guys are picking up? Yeah, it's a big challenge. It's not a big challenge, it's a big opportunity, actually. So I think Ancestry is a company that's built on data and technology. So we have more than 100 million family trees that our users have actually added themselves. So that, you know, this huge, like, deeply passionate community. We've got 20 billion records. We've got more than 11 million people in our DNA network. Um, there's two kind of principles that we follow. So the first one's informed consent when it comes to data. So we might disagree on that one a little bit. But just when we're talking about, like, DNA data and stuff like that. They don't read sure them, no Nigel. Just, just <laughs> yeah. saying. We have to, uh, part of the thing is, like, trying to simplify. Because I think I was thinking about the other day, like, when iTunes first came out and there was like 17 page documents and I'd actually read through it before I signed up and now I'm just like, yep, click agree. So I think yeah. one of the big challenges for us is simplifying so people are able to easily see like what are the three or four key points they need to get out of this. Um, and then the other one's the value exchange. So if we are using your data in this way, this is what you'll get in return and you feel like that's a fair exchange. Um, because as you said, like when you're trying to evolve a product or a service, you, it's hard to do that without data. And if you tell people we need to use your data, we're not exactly sure for what, we're not exactly sure how we're gonna use it. That, that kind of freaks people out, understandably. Um, so so, you know, we use a lot of like beta pools of people and like, you know, we have some really um, passionate advocates who are really interested to be involved in that kind of stuff. Um, but the big ones for us are just, yeah, um, education, uh, consent and the value exchange, sort of three key things. Caitlin, do you think we've gone too far? Should we just pull back, not, not harvest data, use gut feel creativity? I think we've gone too far. I think I just, I mean, my job is a strategist, so I try and work out what people are actually thinking and doing versus what we think they're doing. So I love Justin's point on the digital assistance. You know, everyone's kind of saying, what if my Alexa's listening to me and she's going to tell Amazon what I'm doing? And, you know, she's personified and it's terrifying. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. But the number one Alexa skill is play rain sounds so I can sleep. <laughs> Like that's that's what people are using assistance for right now. So maybe if you start to get into a deep, you know, conversation with Alexa instead of eHarmony about what kind of man you're looking for, maybe then you should worry about what we're doing with that data. But I don't think you're gonna do much with rain sounds personally. And for me, I think most people just want convenience still. I'm not seeing a lot of people pulling out of, as I said earlier, social media or Woolworths delivery because they still want convenience. I don't think that the owner should always be on individuals to understand 17 pages because I'll be honest, I've never once read one of those. I, I sign them and I don't think I'm unusual in that. So, Is it a generational thing? Is it, are we going to get you know, people getting more comfortable with giving up their data or less comfortable? Maybe. I mean, I'm 28, so I'm, I'm of a generation. My dad is 70 and he's an ultimate baby boomer. And we have lots of baby boomer versus millennial conversations where he says, you know, I like to see the whites of their eyes. I don't want to touch this phone. And it's difficult when I live on the other side of the world to get him convinced that FaceTime isn't stalking him. But <laughs> again, that's an example of two people I can't <coughs> And My I mum thinks the TV's anyone. watching her. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a part generational thing, but I would never right. dream of talking for all millennials, and I'm sure boomers don't dream of talking for all boomers. There's some people who are extremely tech savvy and probably read those pages in my group, and there's probably, you know, vice versa. We're, we're running out of time, but I, I did want to just go back to the floor because we haven't uh, probably milked all the questions from the floor on, on this and, and, and the whole subjects of standing for something. Yes. Do you think there's a, a set profit percentage that you should give to the causes that you back before it becomes credible? So should you be giving like three or five percent of your profit? So, so the question. Real champion of a cause. So the question is, should a should a proportion of profit be devoted to the cause that you're overtly supporting in order to make it real? To show your real a metric approach to generosity. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I don't think there's any math about this. It's com companies often make magnificent contributions behind the scenes. I mean, most people don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'd be interested to know. I mean, IKEA is, has the second largest, best, most funded foundation in the world. I don't know if they've made a point about it or not. I don't think they... I've never seen an ad. I work on IKEA, and yeah. they don't. It's, to whoever's point it was earlier, it's an internal purpose-driven point and yeah. people work for IKEA because they like the sustainability angle and but their mission is yeah you know create a better world for, yeah. for many people but not many customers know about it so that's obviously a big number but they don't make a they're not leveraging it that hard mm. I think it's just being meaningful uh doing it in a meaningful way and I think you know I don't know if anyone's in the room from Microsoft but 
looking at what they're doing over in Silicon Valley, recognizing that the growth of high paid engineers that have moved into Seattle has been a massive problem, a social problem for that community and that city. And Microsoft's gone out and said, we need to go and invest in lower grade housing, basically, to allow people to come back into the community to have a more balanced environment. And I think that is directly going at something that they have created and they need to go and fix effectively from a social point of view. And that just is a, it's a huge investment and it's a really meaningful investment behind them. And I know they've made a whole bunch of PR about it. I've got no problem with that because it's, in a, it, it's doing the right thing in the right way. So the consensus seems to be not, there's not a number, but it needs to be, there needs to be something that's yeah, going can. on there. Yeah. yeah. Any, other, any other questions from the floor? No, we have exhausted the subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, with that, I'd like to thank the panel um, and I'll hand you back to, uh, to Derek. Thank you.